Hello and welcome to Elevens is with Lisa. I am Lisa Louise Cook and this is uh, the show where we get together, grab your favorite cup of whatever makes you happy and let's talk about what makes us happy which is genealogy. Um, we are doing this show, of course, live. And so here, if you're joining us here for the live uh, show, you are on YouTube and you'll be able to uh, join in on chat. You can sign in to your Google account and be able to participate in chat. Uh, you can also watch from our show notes page as well. We're happy wherever you are watching from. Um, if you would like to find more at Family Search, you are also in the right place because that's exactly what we're going to do today. And we're just going to um, take a look at a, some essential strategies that I think you really need. And um, this is going to be great if you're kind of new to Family Search, if you're kind of rusty with Family Search, if you would like to learn some techniques that maybe you haven't been using that could get you some more results, you are in the right place as well. I'm even going to throw in some Snagit. Uh, pro tips. Carolyn was talking about in the live chat. Hi, Carolyn, that uh, she's using Snagit. We talked about that in a video uh, a week or two ago. That's still up at genealogygems.com. And I'm going to show you how I'm using Snagit as well to um, create a research log for my family search searching. So gosh, there's so much to talk about today. We're just going to let's roll up our sleeves, okay, and head over to. Um, PowerPoint because I want to uh, dig right in and show you all the great stuff that we, you should be doing over at Family Search. We're going to be focusing in this episode on names using the search fields. Uh, that's the place you're going to typically go first. So uh, there's lots of other ways to dig into Family Search. And uh, the more I got into putting this together, the more I realized, oh, I've got like 10 more episodes I want to do <laughs> in my head. So we'll be doing other areas of family search in future episodes. But uh, in this one, we're going to start where you typically start, which is over at the search field. So let's take a look here. Now, familysearch.org is a free website which is fantastic. It's the largest free genealogy website. Uh, you do need an account to get in and access. So you'll need to log in. And um, that's absolutely free as well. We're going to again, focus on searching for records. Okay. And because let's be honest, most folks when they first go here, or even those of us who've been doing it for a long time, you still tend to kind of just jump in and you tend to maybe uh, throw in people that you're looking for and trying to find some new things. And so we're going to kind of work with that work with the names. Certainly having a research plan makes everything go better. But that's not always how we do it. So let's just be really real here. That's what we do. Um, to find the search fields for looking for genealogy records over at Family Search, and there are millions and millions of digitized records. Uh, you go up to the menu to search and click on records. Now keep in mind, we've talked, I think I've mentioned this before here on the show, not all digitized records are indexed which means when we use the search fields, we really are only searching things that have been indexed, essentially, that are findable. And so there's all kinds of other strategies that we're going to be able to use for the non indexed records. And we will have an episode coming up in the near future on that as well. But let's focus in on using these search fields the most effective way because this is the thing we do most often, we're going to start pretty broad. Okay. And um, typically, people will just kind of toss a name in there and see what happens. So uh, I have in here, uh, Raymond Harry Cook, and he's born in Tumbridge Wells, England, you probably have heard about him before if you've watched this show for a while. And um, I put in a birth year range. Okay. So one of the things to keep in mind, when you're putting in a first and a last name over at Family Search, is that Family search ignores the order of the names. Okay, so this really keeps it pretty broad in terms of what you're going to be getting back to you. Um, so if the person happens to have two last names, I'm not sure I mean, that can happen, or they have an, a last name that's actually made up of two words like van, and you know, another word. Um, 
it will keep those in order. So it's going to keep the um, phraseology, if you will, the phrase of the last name. But, but when it comes to a first name and a middle name, it's not. Hang on. I'm getting too excited. Thank goodness I have my official mug. All right. So it's going to keep this and we're going to run this search. Now, when I first did this, talk about being a broad search, I got about 11,000 or more um, results. And what I really like, and I don't know if you've noticed this, um, it's, it's easy just to kind of get going really quickly, but it does summarize what your search query was at the top of the page, right next to where it says how many results you got. And so we're gonna be taking advantage of that in just a few minutes in our, in our Snagit Pro Tip. But um, in this case, I wanna narrow things down. So while I could start looking through these and obviously after a page or two, you're gonna find that many of them are pretty darn irrelevant to your search. Why don't we just go back and click the exact match box and you'll find one of these next to most of these fields that you put in in the search area. So when we click exact match, now even though Family Search wasn't retaining the order of Raymond first and Harry second, now it does. And it's spelling it exactly the way we're spelling it. So if there's any deviation on the spelling of this name, it's not going to come up in our search results. Even if you're confident that you know the exact names and places, it's really a good idea to clear that checkbox and try your search again. Um, once you see kind of the effectiveness of the exact search, you might go for that first thing. And that's great. Do it. But go back and take it off again and take a quick look at the search results. Even though there might be thousands and thousands, they are going to be prioritized by the ones that Family Search feels are the, the best match and then work its way back. Just kind of like with Google searching, right? You're going to see the, the best results on page one. So if you're not finding exactly what you're looking for, take that exact match off and go ahead and tackle at least the first couple of pages of search results to see if there's anything else in there. Okay. We're also going to try variations. So one of the things we might want to do is add or remove middle names and of course the exact or not exact. So here I could take the exact match off. I could uncheck that box. I could also come down here. Let's do a quick update on our search results. So with the exact match, I had eight results. Here's our 11,430. What's really interesting to me is as I'm looking through all of these, we see lots of variations. We see where the, the middle name is the middle initial. We see it uh, completely not there at all. We see Harry Cook only and not Raymond. But the, the really interesting thing for me was how many of these records really are Raymond Harry Cook. Here's the next page. And it was worth going to the next page, even though at the very bottom of the page, there were some things that were not matches at all. I think it said Thomas Cook. I did find more matches on the next one. Here's one, Raymond H. Cook, but Cook without an E. So it was a little further down the list. And if I know there might be variations in a name spelling that's worth looking for, um, it was on page two. So here I'm taking Harry off. And now let's just make that exact and see that gets rid of uh, all the Thomas Cooks and all that. Now I'm getting 14. So this is kind of nice. It looks like I've captured a few more. Um, one of them, not a match. It's not actually the right person. But most, all the rest of these are. So uh, it's clearly many times the E got left off the last name, which can happen. So um, that shows you just the different ways when we run a search, we want to make sure that we're trying lots of different variations. And I think sometimes it's easy to miss that if you have great success when you run that exact match. Because we get that exact match, we find what we're looking for, we find a couple of more great records. Wow, okay, awesome, that worked. But if you kind of walk away at that point, you're missing all the other possible records that could be there. So when it comes to the strategies for searching for names, try different spelling variations. Even names that you think will never, who would spell Raymond? Anything different than R-A-Y-M-O-N-D. 
it could happen, believe me. Uh, also, if your ancestor, like some of mine, uh, lived in, a, in, a, in the old country, uh, he, Gus Sporin came from Germany, uh, East Prussia, and his Prussian name was Sporowski. He gets to the United States and he changes it to Sporin. So the beautiful part about the search fields over at Family Search is that they give you all of these different alternate name fields. Now, these won't all be sitting out there re- waiting for you, but you can open them up and take advantage of them. So, uh, in fact, you can do up to four of them. Let me show you this. If we go up to search and records, okay, so here's our first name and last name. Notice that it says alternate name up above. Keep, if you can click that, in fact, you can just keep clicking it and open up all four options. It is going to finally limit you, but um, it's kind of neat to try this and go ahead and do it all in one swoop in one search. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to type in all kinds of variations that I can think of. And I'm going to mark every single one of them as exact match, just to see what happens. Now, the way I see this working, um, typically is that if in it doesn't mean that every single one of these has to be in all the records. It just means that at least one of these has to be one of the records that it returns. So it's an exact match, not in like you don't have to have all four variations exactly in the record, just one of them, but it has to have at least one of them. So it's really, really effective because it's narrowing in, but still staying really flexible. So I'm going to take the uh, H off of here and I'm going to make this Raymond. And then I'm going to put in a birthplace. And we can add the uh, birth year as well. And search for that. So I've got four different um, possibilities here. Let's see how many results it really came up with. Okay, 17. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of right in between the the exact of like, I think there were eight and, and 11,000 if we just had just a wild, you know, wide open search. But this one really snagged a lot of different variations on this name, everything that I asked for. And I think pretty much every single one of them. Look at it. Lumbridge Mills, England. <laughs> is the, the, sorry. I mean, it, it was supposed to be Tumbridge Wells, but good for family search. It found it. Lumbridge Mills. Hmm. Okay, we're going to click this one here. This is a marriage regis- registration. And I'm looking at it now. It says possible spouse is Maureen Boyle. Uh, I took a look at this one. This appears to be the only record of all of them that isn't exactly the person that I was looking for. And in fact, it doesn't have Tumbridge Wells on there. So uh, I don't think it does anyway. Oh, but they're from Kent. So now unless he got married again, and I didn't know it. There were two marriages, so I'd have to take a look. But uh, I just love using alternate names. I hope you start using that if you aren't already, because um, it really does work well. And use the exact search mo- um, box that also does a great job. So let's just kind of take a quick look at how that all came out. Um, the type of search we did, the first one was just the one name and doing that in a very broad search, no exact match, got over 11,000 results. Um, about 17 records from what I could tell. I didn't go through all 11,000, but about 17 records was pretty good. And they were all the right person. And then I went in and I did um, just the, that primary name, the, the exact name, the exact match. So I put in Raymond Cook with the spelled correctly and made it an exact match. I only got eight. So while they were all, yes, absolutely him, I was missing things, wasn't I? I missed records. And when I used my alternate names and did all four of them and did exact names, I got 17 results and 17 matches. So you can see that um, the alternate names thing really pays off well. It really, it goes right to the heart of things, but try everything so you don't miss anything. And speaking of alternate names, I know many of you are probably calling to me through the chat, but wild cards. Let's use wild cards. Okay, let's use wild cards. 
you can use these. And one thing to know is that, um, you know, we talk about search operators with Google searching. You know, I wrote a book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, and that's all about, it has tons of different search operators you can use. Many of them are the Boolean operators. They don't work at family search. Okay, it's not the same thing. So with every genealogy website that you use, if it's got a search engine, go take a quick look and um, see what they say they support because every one is built a little bit different. And one of the easiest ways to find that kind of a help page is to Google for it. So put in the name of the um, website and then do a search for search help, like Ancestry Search Help, My Heritage Search Help, the page will pop up. And it's really worth the investment of time uh, to get familiar with it, just like we are here with Family Search. So wildcards, okay, um, there's two that we can use that they recommend that you use most often, which is the asterisk. And it definitely does something a little different than it does over at Google. So we'll just have to set our Google mind aside for a second. Uh, what it does at Family Search is it replaces zero or more characters. And that's a little different than the question mark, which can replace one character. So one letter in the name. If you're not sure if it's an I or a Y or whatever, you're going to use a question mark. But if you, but what you're saying with a question mark is there is a character there, right? So if by chance there's not a character there, or there's going to be maybe two letters that are different, that's where the asterisk comes in. So you're going to want to use that if, if you don't want to insist that there be a character there. But if there is, or even more than one, you'll catch it. So let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so if I'm searching for my great grandfather, Gus Sporin, um, I would put an asterisk after the end of his name. Um, everything I've ever seen in terms of the records I have for Gus, there's Gustav and Gustave and Gustav and you know, all kinds of variations, but it's almost always Gus. It's just always G-U-S first. So this is the perfect application for the asterisk. And you can see I got Gus, Gustave, Gustava. That was a new one to me I hadn't seen before. Here's Gust, which is with a period. So it's an abbreviation of Gustav or, or Gustave. So that works really, really well. And if you just, and there's not too many that you can use, so they're pretty easy to remember, but that would be an application on the first name. Here's what it might look like for using it for a last name. And actually we can do them together in the same name. So if you want to, if you know that um, there's at least one character, I could put a question mark at the end because I'm not sure if Sparowski has an I on the end or a Y on the end. I've seen both. But that's pretty much the only variation I've ever seen on the end of the name. However, in the middle of the name, we have issues because sometimes it's Sparowski, um, Sparowski. Uh, sometimes they, they leave off, um, you know, one of the letters, they add extra letters. I've seen lots of different kind of variations on that. And as you can see, this worked really nicely because it limited, there are very few records, unfortunately, for him at Family Search. I've looked and looked and looked, but it found some nice variations that maybe I haven't seen before. Now, I didn't make these exact, so they don't have to all be Gus, but I've got somebody has question, question, question mark, Sparowski. I want to look at that. Sparowska. Now, that's the first time I've ever seen an A on the end. So I'm going to check into that. It wasn't actually Gus or even anybody related to him, but it's definitely worth it. Look at here, Sparowski. S-P-O-R-O-F-S-K-Y. So one of the nice things about using wildcards is it exposes you to the fact that there are probably even more variations than you've already come across in your searching so far. And the more we get exposure to that and we see, oh, wow, there really are more kind of deviations from the original spelling of the name that we're familiar with, that's going to give us more to kind of go back and go, maybe I should start looking for that name again over at some of the other sites too. Go over to Ancestry, go to my heritage, try them out again. Maybe I've been missing something because it turns out some people put an F in there. All right. Okay, so here's another search strategy. Um, and this really plays right into what you what you do generally in terms of genealogy. We think about cluster research. 
what's the relationship between the person I'm looking for and other people? And that can help lead us to connections and records and all kinds of things. You can use these relationships as your advantage over at Family Search. So that's what we mean by cluster research. Let me show you how this uh, looks. They've actually given you fields for this. Uh, search with a relationship. And it's um, down below at, at the top is where we're typically spending our search time. But if you kind of go scroll down below, you'll see this search with a relationship. So try searching on um, just surnames, a surname that you think is related to that family. Um, if somebody has a really unique first name, it can be very interesting to search for your ancestor and then that very unique um, first name and see if any other interesting records pop up. I really like other person. That could be anybody, right? Okay, so other person is down here at the bottom. And if you click that, I wanna show you how what I did here. I took Raymond Cook and I knew that he had, um, his mother's name was Marianne Susanna Munns. So I'm always really interested to see where Cooks and Munns kind of show up together. So just by putting the surname Munns in the other field, look at the first um, result here. Raymond H. Cook from Tunbridge Wells, born in 1894, this is the guy. And it has listed uh, in, under relationships, other. John W. Munns and Frank F.G. Showers. Now, Showers, that's the first time I've seen this guy. So I'm really interested to find out who he is. But John Munns is Mary Ann's father that I know. So I'm pretty excited about that. And it looks like uh, since this is a census, this is the 1901 census from England and Wales. I'm guessing maybe Frank Showers is going to end up being uh, a boarder or somebody who's living at the house. Uh, what what I do know, what was interesting about this is I was reading, uh, Raymond had written about a 12-page little autobiography uh, towards the very end of his life in the 1970s. He was well into his, he was almost 90. Um, he, I, my math is terrible. Don't, don't test me on math. Okay, but anyway. He was in his later years in the 1970s, and he wrote this autobiography, and he was talking about how John Munns was a retired Baptist minister, and that he would spend uh, one quarter a year with each of the families. So he lived at the cook's house for a quarter of the year, and then he would go to his son's house, and then he'd go to another son's house. So some, what's really cool here is the census taker caught John living there when he did. And the fun thing was that Raymond said that uh, they had one room that was just filled with his books. And he had that many books at each child's house. Isn't that interesting? Kind of fun. Check this out. Finding this record. Did I say I thought that there would never be a variation on how you'd spell Raymond? They, they No, there is. R-E-Y-M-O-N-D. I have never seen that before. Now, I'm sure some of you in chat may say, oh, no, I know somebody with that name. But how funny. Just when you think you have come up with every variation and every alternate spelling of every name, there is another one. So it's out there. And as I kept going down this list, I see Stephen J. Munns. This is the son, one of the sons that John would go and spend the quarter with. So this is Marianne's brother. And I am really interested now to go and take a look at that record as well. The rest of them, I don't recognize a lot of these names, but I think they're worth taking a look at. So really cool to be able to search on these surnames that uh, interconnect with the family names that you already know and um, see who you can find that way. All right. Now I promised you that I was going to share with you a pro tip and we're gonna kind of do a call back to episode 61, which was devoted to how to use Snagit. Now, if you're not familiar with it or you're new to this show, welcome, we're so happy you're here. Say hi in the chat if you're here in the live show. If not, go down to the comments and leave a comment and say hi. Um, we're glad you're here. And one of the things we talked about two episodes ago, two, three, I told you math is not, my strong suit today. Episode 61, we talked about Snagit. And what we did was we used this web clipping tool. It's a software program. And uh, you can purchase it, download it to your computer, and it will take screen clippings for you. 
Yes, Evernote can, can screen clip other programs. You know, your computer might have a, a snipping tool built in. Let me tell you, they don't do anything like Snagit does. Snagit has so many different amazing power tools built in, and uh, it's a very cool tool. So we, we introduced you to that in episode 61, but I want to show you one of the ways that I use it to create a search log. When you're searching over a place like Family Search and you're trying all these variations, here we are saying, let's up our game and expand how many different variations we're going to do in alternate names. You want to keep track of what you've been doing so you're not constantly going back over old territory. So um, I want to show you how I do this. Now, if you're interested in Snagit, go check out episode 61. We have a special, they gave us a special discount, so be sure and use that. And I noticed that when you click that, sometimes they will automatically add in like an automatic additional 10 or $12 for an upgrade for next year. You can always opt out of that, so you don't have to. I think Snagit runs around $49.95, and then you get 15% off with our coupon code. We always appreciate when you use our coupon codes. But let me show you the research log, uh, because this is, kind of a neat way to do this. I've done a clipping. First of all, I want to highlight who I was paying attention to here. And John W. Munns showed up in our search, right? I clipped four different variations on the search that I ran. They're all here in the tray. I hold down the control or the command key and just click on each one and right click to combine them together in a template. In episode 61, I showed you the pedigree chart or that I think it was a timeline template. This, we're just gonna do the custom steps. I just wanna see, boom, 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 what did I do? So click combine, take a moment, give your research log a name. So I typed in here, cook research log. And uh, I wanna put a color background, I'm gonna do white, just for, so it's, it can be transparent or it can be a different color. Um, I might want to print this out, so I'm going to make it white. And here we go. It automatically took all four clippings, and you can change the, the canvas color. You can do all kinds of stuff on here. So if you want to, you can change it. I might make this gray just so these pop out a little bit. All these elements, it automatically put the one, two, three, four. You can move these around if you want to. Just click on them. Um, up here, if I click text, now I can go back and go, oh, I want to put the date that I did this search. So I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna type in the date. And each of these clippings actually is movable and resizable as well. So I'm gonna save this image to my hard drive. And now I have a research log. It's so fast and easy. You're, you're looking at each one. I remember we talked about that up at the top of your search query, when you get your results page, you're gonna see how many results you got, and you're gonna see that little sum summation of what it was you searched for. Well, rather than clipping the entire page or retyping that into an Excel spreadsheet, I use Snagit, go back and just grab. I'm not only going to be able to see the summation of what it was, let's go to my log, I'll show you. You can see one of two results and what I searched for. Here I got uh, 1,300 results and I searched for this. So I can start making notes. You can organize this any way you want. You can create your own template that leaves room for typing in notes. You can see here I resized. I just clicked on this the clipping itself that's within the log and I resized them so they were all kind of uniform. You can do whatever you want. You get the hang of this and this is going to come in super handy. It's going to give you that trail so you know exactly what you've been running and when you did it. Um, kind of a neat new take on research logs. I hope that comes in handy for you. If you've been using Snagit since we talked about it here on the show, I would love to hear what you think of it, how you're using it. Are you doing something like this that you have we haven't done before? Um, or a new idea? Share it with us all. Please uh, head down to the comments. Uh, here in the live show, you can do it in chat. Those typically stay with the video, but if you really uh, want to make it available to everybody in our Genealogy Gems family, leaving comments at the bottom of the show notes page over at genealogygems.com slash 11s is in episode 61. It says 61. 61 was the Snagit episode. This is 64. Right, so you might want to go to 64 and say how you're using Snagit. Either one, uh, if you go to episode 61, the folks who are interested in Snagit will learn from your experience. 
So we'd love to hear how you've been using it. All right, so uh, last name search strategies. We kind of focused on some of the things to do with the first name, but for last names, over time, the spelling of a last name, of course, can change in a family. We've all run into that. So try those variations. Try language variations. We talked about what was the name back in the old country. When it comes to women, uh, records might be under their married last name or their maiden last name. And this is all about when the record was created. A lot of times I get that question. Um, how should I... If I find this person, how do I put this woman into my tree? Or how do, what should I name this? Because, you know, most of her life, she's under her married name. That's how I think of her. Uh, in fact, she showed up on somebody's family tree, but by that married name. But I know that her maiden name was something else. In my book, you know, each woman gets put in the family tree under her, the name that she was born with, right? This is her maiden name. And then when it comes to the records, it's about what name she had at the time. What was her marital status at that time? And that's going to be the name that you're going to use. So we need to try all those different variations to make sure that we get everything. And don't assume that other people who put this woman in their tree is putting them in, putting her in correctly with her maiden name. They may only have her under a married name. So if you're trying to search other people's trees, You'll want to look at all options. Something else that Family Search recommend over at their website, as I was looking through some of their search tips, was to try leaving the last name field blank. And that they said that this was particularly effective when searching for female ancestors. It works well with the names of the spouse or the parents. So if you leave the last name blank and you just put in the first name, I, I would think this would work better with a more unique name. But then you could also go down and start searching for spouses or parents. We talked about searching for relationships. So that's certainly something to try. We could also search for a life event. And I think um, this is something that, of course, helps differentiate each person, particularly those with common names. So we're going to put in things like birth and marriage, uh, places where they live, their residence, uh, death locations, and they have any. So you can, any location at any time that they may have been associated with that you're aware of or, and, and the any field is really cool if you had somebody who moved around a lot and you really want to focus in on what was happening during a certain time they were in Colorado. Well, you can put in their name, but you can put Colorado in and it doesn't have to be associated with anything that you're familiar with so far. It doesn't, a marriage, a birth, a whatever just put in Colorado and see what happens. It's, it's a really interesting strategy to use and it might surface some things that normally get buried pages and pages down in the results list. Uh, so we can enter the place and I like to put in the range. So even if I know the birth year is 1803, I still like to put in a range on either side. That gives me an opportunity to click the exact match box but still have some flexibility, right? So if we put in 1803 in Tennessee is where he was born, I could click exact match, but if anybody was off, even by a year, I'm gonna miss it. So if I put the range in up front, then I can still click exact match and get the advantage of narrowing in. So let's run that search. We're gonna go in for Joel Mitchell type in Tennessee. Here's my, my range, 1802 to 1804. We could also have multiple events. So I'm going to click death and put in uh, the exact year that I know that it was, 1872. And then down here, we could add a spouse's first name. And in fact, Joel was married twice. So I can click it again and I can put in both wives, both the first names in one swoop and click search. Ah, so we got 20 results on page one out of 1100 total. And um, I see here Deborah Mitchell's mentioned many times. This is great. We could go back and now let's try our exact matchbox again. 
so interesting. So you, if I click both of these, I kind of expected to see something, got nothing. So we have to be really careful how we use that. I think it's the dyer. I don't think so. Most of these records, when they mention the dyer, it's just the letter D. And so exact match isn't going to pick up that first letter. It's going to say it has to be the entire name that we typed in there. And here I'm putting in the birthplace, it, make that exact and make that Tennessee. Now I'm down to 21. And that's really, really interesting. Um, most of these have some relationship to what I'm looking for. It certainly uh, helps. I'm going to click filter by collections. If you're not using this, I, I hope that you'll put this on your radar. Sometimes seeing your results in a totally new way is so, so helpful. And in this case, we're looking at them in groupings by collection. And it will tell you how many records are in each one. And um, somehow that's just that's just so much easier sometimes than looking through all this information. Here we can really see, oh, that's right. Okay, I want marriage. Oh, I want a slave schedule. I need the census. Whatever the record type is, we're going to be able to jump right to it. And, and we're not having to weed through this list we're going to go straight to the four records that are passenger lists and see what they say. So I really like that. Take advantage of that collections tab. Uh, just another great way to view search results. Okay, uh, talking about events, things that happen in people's lives, uh, that is down here. And we could try searching for lots of different events. And one of the things, again, that Family Search was recommending was using the residence option. So you can use this to find records uh, identifying where a person was living. Could be really helpful um, if you suspect they live somewhere or if you're looking for city directories, that kind of thing. Um, some records contain an address or a last place of residence. So if they mention that, like a draft card might say where they last lived or where they, where they live now, then this might pick it up. So residence is kind of a fun field. I agree with them. I think that's pretty neat. And tips for adding events. Okay, so you can use any event if you know a date or a place for an event other than a birth, marriage, death, or residence. So here's an example of this. Um, if you use any event, you might be able to find, we talked about military records, draft records, military enlistment, or immigration records, um, just putting in the year. So I know I'm looking for what was happening during a certain time. I'm trying to fill in that timeline, you know, that has that annoying gap in the middle of it. You could come to Family Search and put in the person that you're looking for and come down to any, and you don't have to know what you're looking for, but you can just say, I just want the records that fall right in this sweet spot. That's going to, again, give you the option for broad, right? Throw out the big net, but at the same time, go really specific on time frame. And uh, I think of that as kind of like the the num range search that we do over at google.com. It works really well because it just gets a lot of the noise out of the way. So I had a lot of fun with this. So <laughs> doing this show is so awesome because, um, you know, I get a chance to use my own ancestors, Bill's ancestors, people in our family as the guinea pigs. And I have to tell you, I... Again, sometimes it's a good thing and it's a bad thing because I got so close to like almost not being ready to go this morning because I had gotten so sidetracked. I found records I haven't seen before. And you know, it's such a good reminder that if you feel like you've been to Family Search before and you've just exhausted it, oh, Lisa, I've tried everything, I tried all of your tips, and I never find anything, go back because the rate at which they are adding content and they're indexing content, they may have already had the records that you needed. It was just that they absolutely weren't indexed. So they were not coming up in the search results. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they aren't searchable, right? It would have taken you forever to go through and look at page by page trying to find it yourself. But then you go back in and boom, it's there. And that's what kept happening to me this week. This was so cool. I found um, Raymond Cook's naturalization records, <laughs> family search. And in fact, it reminded me, I had come across 
many, many months ago, might even be years ago, um, I knew that they had the records. They were not uh, indexed, nothing. And I just, you know, when push comes to shove and you only have so much time, I didn't go in and look page by page. Well, I guess they've been indexed because boom, they were there in my list of seven results. And when I clicked the uh, camera icon, wow, here were the digitized records. And get this, there was, it took me to page 88, which was the first page of the, the kind of batch for him. But as we always do, just like with the census, you got to go back pages and you got to go forward pages and check. So often there's a backside, there's multiple, there could be a whole folio of records in this packet. And in fact, there was images 87 all the way through 96 had digitized images for his naturalization records. And these were so cool because they included pages of uh, testimony and documentation from his witnesses who were fellow musicians at the uh, Eau Claire Theater, I think was up in Wisconsin. He originally uh, came from England and went to Regina and worked at the Rose Theater. And then he ended up coming down and well, he met a lovely musician in the, in the orchestra pit, married her and came to Wisconsin and they were at the Eau Claire, Eau Claire Theater. Well, Many of these musicians were his um, witnesses. And it's funny because I even have photos and things from that theater with these people. So it all comes together. Never say never, never give up, never surrender, folks, right? And be sure that when you do find a record that you go through all the, go back and forward as far until you hit another record that is not your person anymore because there might be many, many records. And don't give up. Those records may be there today that were not there yesterday. And that is a good feeling when you're a genealogist, isn't it? <laughs> Tell me in the comments if you've ever kind of thrown up your hands and given up only to go back and find a record that you didn't know was there. I'd love to hear it. We all need some inspiration. Okay, in the place field. So we talked about kind of when things were happening during a certain time frame. How about certain places? Try searching at least uh, at a more or less specific place level. So if you've been focusing on Tunbridge Wells, Kent, England, maybe I need to take the town off. Maybe we need to just go into the county or just look for the state or just look for the country. Um, depending on the record, they may or may not be mentioning these specific locations. So we want to, again, not only vary up the name, but vary up these locations. And use the wildcards and place names too. It's not limited just to names. So you can use the asterisk, you can use the question mark to um, get variations on names. I have definitely found people spelling locations differently, particularly with German names. Uh, Grunwald keeps getting spelled differently. So these asterisks and uh, question marks come in super handy so that you don't miss anything. In the place field, you can remove the place from the search. So instead, instead of tackling it from the beginning by putting in the place, run the initial search on the person and then use the filters. Now the filters are on the left side of the screen and these you can then narrow down your search results by place. So we're going to come down here to location. And once you run the initial search, then you can put in a location and start kind of playing with it from there and seeing how the results change. It's just kind of another different way to do it, but it might reveal things to you that you didn't spot the first time. So that works really well. And, and sometimes you just have to put the country in <laughs> and keep it really, really broad. Um, in the years field, what you could do is try, definitely, we mentioned adding the year before and after so that you can run exact matches and still have some flexibility, uh, but also search with no year at first, just like don't include the place, don't include the year, but then filter. So run your initial search results and then head back over to the left-hand side and um, come down here. You can see filter your results by. So now I'm gonna click um, birth year and it says, oh, there's 12 records fall within the 1800s. So it's going to give you the filter, but, but but based on the results that you have, which is why it's really nice to run it first and then come down and take advantage of the filter. And it separates out years. So it's saying, well, if you want to filter just for the birth records 
versus if you want to filter for residence records. And uh, this one worked really nicely. So I got eight records here. All right. So let's kind of sum things up with some advanced search strategies that you can put into play. Uh, include multiple events in your search when you're looking for a record that likely contains all the events. So an example of when there's only going to maybe be uh, one, well, actually two, for a death record, try searching both for birth and death events, because there's a very good chance that the birth year will be mentioned in that record, right? Because they know when that person was born. But of course, another example of the opposite would be birth records. We don't want to include death information because the record may not obviously have death information unless perhaps a child died at birth. So um, you have to think about the kind of record that you're searching for and then maybe take advantage of when you know it's going to have multiple years or multiple time frames, you can add those in. To search for a child's birth records, uh, enter the child's name, and then you can also click parents and enter the parent's name. And you can try variations. So you could try putting in both of the parents' names, uh, maybe just the father's full name, the mother's full married name only, uh, then her full married name, let's see, her, maybe her maiden name, I think I meant to put maiden name, the father's full name uh, with the mother's full, uh, first name. So you, you get the idea try different variations. Who knows, you know, what that record really says and how it was transcribed or indexed. You want to um, try every possibility. Here's something kind of interesting. To find all the children in a family, you could leave the name blank altogether. Don't put in the name of a person. Go down on the left-hand side and click parents, and then conduct your search using the parents' names and try all the different variations. Let me show you what that looks like here. So here, we're leaving this blank. We're not gonna put in first and last name. We're gonna come down here and click father. So I'd like Family Search to tell me who were all the kids for Raymond Cook. And the mother is Isabel. And I can mark them exact match. I didn't mark her exact match, because I've seen so many variations on the spelling of her name. But look at that, one click and here are the kids. Really, really handy if you kind of want to see that snapshot of a group and perhaps a child that maybe pops up that you weren't aware of. So that would be a really interesting strategy. And as you can see here, if you are a premium member, be sure and head to the show. You know, the show notes are available to everybody over at family at uh, genealogygems.com slash 11s. Just go click episode 64. You can read through all the show notes. Um, the premium members, I, thank you so much for being premium members. You get the download. So if you go down to the resources section, <clears throat> click and download the PDF. It's a cheat sheet totally ad free version of the show notes. It's super handy. And it's got everything step by step that we've talked about so that you can have all of these strategies at your fingertips. And that's one of the big advantages of being a premium member in addition to all of the exclusive content, the videos and the podcasts and stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so marriage records. If we're going to search for a marriage record, we're going to enter the name of one person in the first and last field names. And then you could click spouse and enter their name as well. And of course, try variations. We're starting to sound like a broken record here, but it really makes a difference. The spouse's first name, the wife's maiden name, all the different variations. And you could try limiting your search results to marriage records only, right? So we're gonna take more advantage of the filters. We're gonna look more at the collections of the type of results that we're getting. And that will help us be able to just go to marriage. So if you click type, you can, there's a type field and you can select marriage. One of the most important things that you can do is to have a specific research goal. Okay, now we haven't been doing that. We haven't been following our own advice in this episode. But in reality, if these things aren't paying off, then chances are you really do need to get more specific. And just looking for anything that's out there isn't always the best way to go. So 
when we talk here on the show, I'm trying to give you lots of different tools and strategies. My hope is that you're going to have that research plan. You're going to develop your research goal, a very specific research question, and then plug and play, you know, all the different strategies that we talk about because everybody's situation is different. But a research plan, a research goal gives you focus and that can help a lot. Again, start with a broad search. These are just some of the best practices to keep in mind. You you don't have to enter all the information in all the search fields. In fact, you so often get better results when you leave a lot of them blank and then you filter down. And that helps you see the different variations as you run the filters. Remember, family search doesn't support the Boolean operators like Google does. So we need to stick to the wild cards that we saw, the asterisk, the question mark. This seems obvious, but I think it's so important to keep saying this out loud. Expect records and indexes to contain errors, spelling variations, and estimations. And that includes people's family trees. (laughs) People get really frustrated. Oh, this family tree, this person's family tree is just so wrong. Well, expect it. Expect it. That keeps you on your guard. You realize you're the frontline defense. You're the one who's going to analyze what you're finding and you're going to look at the evidence and weigh it and make the determination. So just expect to see that and then take that into account as you're running the different searches. You've got a great way now to keep a research log. It's very, very doable. So you can try several different times, several different variations, right? And uh, even if your ancestors had easy to spell names, this is an important one to remember. I have to remember this sometimes because I I get caught up in that. Well, who in the world is going to spell it any other way? Well, there's a lot of folks out there. Expect spelling discrepancies, even on a name like Raymond, right? So Anderson, S-O-N could be Anderson, S-E-N. Even if they're not Swedish or Norwegian, whatever you think, oh, well, I know how they spelled it in Norwegian. It doesn't matter because somebody down the road was writing that name down and they got it all wrong. So that's fine. Use your, your wild cards and that will take care of it. And always, always look at the image. Okay. Check and see. Do you see the camera icon? That's showing you that there's an image there available at Family Search. You want to look at it because... All the stuff that you're seeing transcribed that's typed up on the screen, that is not everything in the record by a long stretch. Some records it might be. It might be you find, oh, I looked at it and I didn't see anything else that there was an addition to it, but most times not. I mean, think of that naturalization record I found. There is, that was the tip of the iceberg in terms of what was indexed and what was I saw typed on the screen. So much more, volumes more of information in the original image. Go check it out. Uh, If it's at all possible, uh, it it, it will have more information, sometimes just even written in the margins. So that's kind of a fun thing. So guys, that's family search. That's your kind of introduction to the really essential strategies that you want to take advantage of. Again, be sure and take advantage of the show notes for this because uh, that's got everything written up for you and downloadable for you. If you're a premium member, go check it out, genealogygems.com slash elevenses. And if you are here at YouTube, you can go down to the video description. If you look right below the video here, it'll say show more. And if you click that, it actually opens up a whole bunch of stuff that I take a lot of time to type up for you because I want it to be easy for you to find all the links to stuff that we're talking about. All right, so let's head over here. And I I just have to guess that you guys are all over here in chat and talking about um, all the different strategies that you use and that kind of stuff. I'm I just think it's awesome the way you share your own personal knowledge. Cannot find the show notes. Okay, so Mary Duke, here's the thing. Uh, (laughs) I say go get the show notes. The show notes will be there. They are published at the end of the day today because we take everything that we talk about here and I look at your questions and we get all of that finished up. So you'll see the, the... holding place for the show notes. You'll see the video over there at episode 64. And at the end of the day, you will in fact see all the detailed show notes based on the transcription of this episode. So thank you for reminding me. I should have said that right at the beginning. (sighs) Missed that. Okay. Um, Lots of great things here. Found a potential rabbit hole to go down for third grandfather. Awesome. 
Thank you, Tracy. She says she's enjoying this. Oh, Cindy, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're enjoying this episode. It, it's just been so much fun. Uh oh, the teacher sees that we've been chatting during class. Yes, Anne, I know you. I know you, so I know that you probably were. <laughs> I'm glad you chat during class, and I think it's so awesome that there's an opportunity to do that. Um, talking about classes, I just wanted to share with you. It's so fun to be able to share that I was out on the road um, and have something. I feel like my poor phone just has nothing in it anymore, but I was out on the road. I went to Mississippi, and um, I know I showed you my coffee mug that they gave me last week, but I just had to show you. I finally got my pictures, and uh, what a great group. Now, this is not the entire group, but this is the core group of people who really put that whole seminar on together, uh, I guess it's a week or two ago. And we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, it's so good to be out seeing all of you in person. I, I look forward to the times when we get a chance to run across each other's paths in person. And um, one of the easiest way to run across my path here over at YouTube is to click the subscribe button because what that will do is it will put uh, my channel, Genealogy Gems, in your favorites list which makes it super easy. Every time you go to uh, YouTube, you'll see us right there listed. And it's easy to find us and you kind of help us out here on the channel and support it. I was going to tell you about other stuff that's going on. Let me look here. Okay, so I have a question. Have you inherited dishes that none of your kids want? <laughs> I have like three sets. Um, if you have beautiful china plates and they came from grandma or great grandma or whoever, grandpa, let me tell you next week, I'm going to show you my latest craft project. It's not going to be the whole episode, but um, I haven't been doing that as much. So the thing you'll hear at YouTube, and it's something I want to chat with you here at the end of this session, and I, I, I know some people will just click off, but I want you to know um, at YouTube, people aren't used to more than one topic. So I started this as kind of a variety show for genealogy. And I love doing that. And I love showing you my crafts, and my projects. And the folks at, in Mississippi were reminding me how much they enjoyed seeing those different uh, topics each week. But what I found was is that people who just find me on YouTube would get frustrated and just click off because it's like, wait a minute, she's not just talking about family search. She's talking about all these other things. Yeah, they haven't met me yet because I talk about all kinds of things. But um, I love doing this kind of stuff and I love sharing it with you. So uh, next week I am going to share with you my craft project and I think you're going to find that this is going to be a really interesting way to pass on the family china to kids who don't want all the family china. I'll just leave it right there. But what I will say is I am looking at the uh, possibility of kind of trying something new that YouTube lets us do, which is it lets us do this initial um, live show and then you can actually send it to connect to another live show. And my thought here is, is that it actually kind of hurts our stats a little bit when if I cover more than one topic, people come for that topic, the first one, and then I start talking about something else and then they go, uh, I don't know what's going on. And then they click off and the click off, the bounce off is what kind of hurts our numbers. So what I'm thinking about doing to be creative here is to, um, do the initial topic like we focused on family search here today. And then for those of you who want to hang on, it will uh, end transition. They're, they're, I'm guessing there'll be a countdown. I've never done this before, so I don't know, but I think that there'll be a countdown and like a one minute or something. And then the next live stream will start so that we can then do more of our informal chat and I can share with you my project and show you pictures and answer your questions and talk more in chat and answer questions. That's my thought. So keep in touch. Um, make sure that you're signed up for our free newsletter. You'll find the link in the video description down below here at YouTube or on our homepage at genealogygems.com. You can click and uh, get the newsletter. You'll get a free little PDF download with that, which is kind of a fun treat. But the newsletter will be where I'll kind of announce if I can make this all work and we can do kind of a dovetail, which also will accomplish one more thing in that People generally on YouTube don't watch our videos. They just don't. Now, I know you guys here in the live show love it, and I love it too. So one of the things that this will do is it'll give us an opportunity to focus in on the main topic, do it for a little shorter time period, and then dovetail into more of a conversational live feed right after for those who would like to do that. And it doesn't hurt the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. So 
we will find a way to make all of this work and meet the needs of as many people as possible. So that's my goal. And I hope uh, that sounds interesting to you. I hope you'll give us a try and see next week. Like I said, there might be a countdown in between the two videos, two sessions, the live sessions. Um, but if you're willing to hang on or go refresh your, your tea while you wait, all the better. Um, until then, until I get to work figuring all that out, I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope they heard some strategies today that you're going to have some success with. I want to hear about it in the chat uh, next week and certainly in the comments here on YouTube and at the Genealogy Gems channel. I need to get to work on show notes so people can go get those and you'll have those by the end of the day. Thank you so much for watching, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.